Hi, my name is Hans Bohm. I work for the Android part of Google. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, how to use atomics and in particular weekly ordered atomics in C++ correctly, which is sort of a misunderstood issue. And this is an attempt to uh, reduce that misuse a little bit. Uh, why do we care about atomics at all? Well, the general context here is multi-threaded programming in C++. In general, if we're writing a multi-threaded program in C++, in C++ the rule is uh, that we have to avoid data races. We should make sure that a, a variable uh, or an object, formerly a memory location, is never accessed while another thread is modifying it. Uh, that's the default rule. We typically enforce that by using some sort of synchronization mechanisms like mutexes. Uh, the, cano the canonical example is up here on the slide. Uh, so if we want to increment a shared variable, for example, we might protect that with the mutex uh, and then go increment the variable, making sure that nobody else has access to x at the same time, making sure that all other accesses to x are protected by the same mutex. Um, and everything works just fine. And that's the normal way of doing business. It has a bunch of advantages and a bunch of disadvantages. Uh, the big advantage is that it operates at different atomicity granularities. So I can use the same scheme to, in order to protect complicated operations that, uh, uh, that update complicated data structures. So long as I make sure that only one person updates that data structure at a time by using mutexes, by using a mutex to protect the data structure, everything works just fine. Um, that's the big advantage here. Uh, the disadvantage that people always associate, the disadvantages that people associate with this, some real, sometimes imagined, as you saw in some of the, the previous talks, uh, is that uh, there are some concerns about lock ordering and deadlock that get introduced here. Those are, those are real. Uh, and need to be addressed in the lock case. Sometimes they can be. Uh, there are other ways to address those as well that are very similar to locks here. You've already heard there's a transactional memory technical specification that largely avoids this issue. So there are other ways to avoid that, uh, but certainly that's, that's a problem with the lock-based approach. Uh, the lock-based approach also basically doesn't work in the, if you're trying to provide mutual exclusion with a signal or an interrupt handler uh, because you're fairly likely to deadlock. If you get a signal or an interrupt while you're already holding a lock, you're not going to be able to acquire that lock again in the signal or interrupt handler. Um, another disadvantage is that if you, particularly if you care about uh, predictable execution times, it's possible that your operating system schedule may be uncooperative and preempt a thread while you're holding a, while you're holding a mutex in which case for a while the other threads may not be able to make progress either, and that occasionally causes problems. Uh, the biggie here, at least in perception, is that people think of mutexes as being slow, and therefore they tend to avoid it. Uh, so before C++ 11, uh, the exper well, the de facto rules were that really all accesses needed to be protected by locks. This was the tool. Mutexes, uh, in some form or another, were the tool you had available in order to prevent races between threads. Uh, on the other hand, programmers generally were not happy with that. What, what we generally found was that a lot of programmers ended up circumventing the rules in one way or another, and often those rules were very, uh, those violations, those circumventions were very questionable. Uh, so the better ones actually consisted of abusing the, the volatile keyword in C and C++, which already existed, sometimes combining it with assembly language for fences and so on. Uh, in other places, people just argued that, uh, well, it's okay if I just access this one variable here without a mutex. I know everything works correctly. Uh, the problem is by doing that, you're lying to the compiler and the compiler will draw some conclusions from that which will be wrong, and uh, uh, we have no idea what will actually happen when you upgrade to the next compiler that, that, that's more aggressive about that sort of thing. Um, the gains that people expected from circumventing these rules were sometimes real and, and sometimes imagined. Uh, we learned in one, uh, um, there was an earlier talk that actually discussed some of the trade-offs between uh, using locks and trying to program without locks. Uh, 
Uh, but we also learned in the keynote it doesn't actually matter. People will use it anyway because they think it's faster even if it isn't. Um, so what we did in C++11 is we in actually introduced a notion of an atomic variable uh, that of an atomic object that actually can be accessed concurrently outside a critical section. Um, so these, ob these are objects that are accessible uh, without, that can be safely concurrently accessed. Uh, and they behave atomically. So they, it looks as though if I update one of these in one thread, the, it looks to the other thread as though the update has either been performed completely or not at all. They're indivisible in that sense. Uh, furthermore, by default, if I don't do anything else, they preserve a reasonably nice programming model. They still ensure that I get interleaving-based semantics. I can still view multiple threads as being executed as though there was some scheduler deciding at each point to randomly pick an instruction from one of those threads and executing it next. Things still all look sane. Um, and uh, that all works reasonably. Uh, it's reasonably easy to, re to, to deal with these things in large part because, in fact, these atomics behave, for most purposes, if I'm not concerned with signal or interrupt handlers, they behave exactly as though they were operations that were, in fact, protected by mutex. In fact, they, they could be implemented that way. So these atomics are basically as easy to use as a mutex, uh, provided all your critical section only have a, sections only have a single operation on a single variable in them. Then they're exactly the same. Uh, they do have the advantage that they're a bit faster than a mutex, uh, at least in the, the easy cases where you're just replacing a critical section that has a single operation inside the critical section. Uh, on the other hand, already with this kind of atomic, you have to be careful. There's a large research literature on basically programming complicated algorithms in lock-free ways using these kinds of atomic operations. And the trick there is ta to take a more complicated operation that in fact operates lots of, lots of distinct memory locations and make it look as though all of those operations together are a single atomic operation, even though they're implemented in terms of many separate atomic operations. And that's in fact quite tricky. People routinely get those algorithms wrong. Doing this sort of thing is something that you should be really careful about. Uh, if we take a closer look at these sequentially consistent atomic operations that C++ provides, uh, in fact, the implementation gives us a whole bunch of properties for free, essentially, just by using the atom these atomic operations. Uh, clearly, the implementation has to guarantee that the operation looks indivisible, all or nothing to other threads. Uh, in, but in all, order to preserve this, this interleaving execution-based illusion, the fact, so that it still looks like um, threads just do one step at a time in thread order, we have to provide some other guarantees, which I can sort of very roughly characterize as I have on the slide. I'm lying a little bit here. I actually need a little bit more, but these are the important ones. Um, so basically, the guarantees I need that I'll be relying on is if I execute an atomic store, if I update an atomic variable, I need to, in fact, make sure, and we'll see examples of this later on, uh, I need to make sure that all prior memory operations, in fact, become visible to other threads before that atomic store. Uh, there's no reordering sort of issue that, uh, that goes on. And on modern hardware with modern compilers, that's a significant constraint. Similarly, on the load side, I need to make sure, and again, we'll see examples of this, loads must complete before subsequent memory accesses take effect. Uh, and that's another restriction that's, uh, that has to be enforced by the implementation here. It also turns out, for reasons we'll see in one of the subsequent examples, I need to make sure that if I have an atomic store followed by an atomic load, those are actually not reordered by the implementation. And I have on the slides here some, some explanation of what these costs. These are actually not free on, on most implementations. Uh, so the uh, indivisibility generally is free on modern hardware. Uh, the store ordering is free on x86, but generally but costs you a memory barrier instruction on something like ARM v7. Um, loads are basically have a similar situation. 
Um, and then it turns out that on both ARM v7 and x86, ensuring the, the ordering of an atomic store and a subsequent atomic load is, is expensive. Um, so to illustrate some of these things, let me give you some simple examples here in terms of sort of plain atomic, uh, plain sequentially consistent C++ atomics. So this is sort of the most canonical example that you can think of in some sense. Uh, we'll revisit this later as well. It's often called the MP or message passing example. Uh, I'm using an atomic variable just to communicate some one piece of information from one thread to another. Uh, so in this particular case, thread one is initializing some data and then setting a flag, setting an atomic flag uh, to true, saying that the data is initialized and it's now safe to access. Thread two reads the atomic flag and then uh, checks and then goes ahead and reads the data if it's set because now it knows it, it's been initialized. Uh, there is no way, basically the atomic is being used here as synchronization to make sure that there can't be concurrent accesses to X because thread two is using the atomic to wait until thread one is done with it. So there's no data race on X, no concurrent accesses on X, and everything works correctly. Uh, the implementation has to ensure that X equals 17, in fact, uh, is visible to the other thread before, X, before the assignment to X init which might be a constraint that's not immediately apparent, but if you put yourself in the compiler's position, normally the two assignments in thread one look completely independent, and it looks to the compiler, for example, like those could be reordered because they're changing different locations. But it's actually important in this case that the compiler not reorder those and make sure that the assignment to X, uh, to X actually is visible if the assignment to X init is visible to another thread. And that's all sort of bundled up in the implementation of the atomics. Uh, so this actually, among the properties that I listed earlier, this needs the store ordering guarantee, it needs the S guarantee, X equals 17, needs to be visible before the S store to X init. Similarly, the load from X needs to be visible before the store, it needs to be visible after uh, the load from X init. Uh, you might think that that's automatic because it's inside a conditional, but modern processes speculate they'll guess the outcome of the conditional that won't stop them. Uh, so that's an explicit guarantee. It doesn't need the store to load ordering guarantee, actually. So here's a slightly different example that explains some of these, again, some of the implementation requirements that we have. Um, so what's going on here is thread one stores true to X. In initially, everything is false, um, and then checks if, uh, uh, if the variable Y, the atomic variable Y is still false, that means thread two hasn't done anything yet, then I can go ahead and turn the east-west traffic light to, to green. Uh, thread two goes ahead and stores two, two into the other variable and does this complementary thing, turning the north-south traffic lights to green. And the argument here is that this is safe uh, because one of those uh, because either thread one or thread two, at least, uh, will, need, will see a variable that's already set to true, and therefore they won't both turn, turn to green at once. Uh, this particular example also requires the store load ordering guarantee. I need to make sure that the compiler doesn't rearrange the load in thread one, it doesn't rearrange the load from Y with the store to X, because if the store happens second, then in fact you can convince yourself pretty easily that it's possible for both of them to turn the lights green and things will go wrong. So this is an example where we actually need that SL ordering guarantee that I had before. Um, so this sort of gets us to what does all of this cost and why people want weekly ordered atomics. So on a simple micro benchmark, a memory fence, or some often called a memory barrier, typically costs something between two and 200 cycles, which is a pretty big range, and architectures really are very variable. Uh, but we, I think we're sort of generally converging on a dozen or two dozen cycles on most, on, on most of the modern processes. Uh, this is a cost, um, 
this is a cost that's negligible, maybe almost compared to a cache miss or memory contention or something like that. But it's still a very expensive, co expensive uh, cost compared to most instruction execution. And the problem is, if we went back a couple of slides here, in order to ensure these various guarantees, it turns out we need uh, memory fence instructions, we need the, or memory barrier instructions in order to have the hardware guarantee that these ordering constraints are not violated at the hardware level. So in order to implement atomics, I need to make sure that the compiler doesn't reorder the instructions and I need to make sure that the hardware doesn't reorder the instructions. Typically, make, preventing the hardware from reordering the instructions is actually the more expensive part. That requires these memory instructions. So basically, so I have several tens of uh, cycles of overhead associated with each of these sequentially consistent atomic operations, potentially. It actually turns out there's much less of an issue on x86. Uh, on x86, I only need, uh, need a fence for an atomic store. I don't need anything extra for an atomic load. Uh, so the cost is actually more modest. On something like ARM v7, I generally need at least one fence for every operation. For an atomic read, modify, write, an atomic increment or something like that, I need two. And uh, for ARM v8, I have sort of costs that are a little, that are probably somewhere in between in general because essentially the C++ uh, sequentially consistent atomic semantics are, are implemented in the hardware there. So I, I, I can do a little bit better. Uh, so I, there's actually something that's worth observing about the uh, the cost here, so in passing, many people think of the extra costs associated with these memory fences to implement sequentially consistent atomics as uh, being, ve being very high and uh, prohibit basically getting in the way of scaling of your, of your software. That's actually not the right, quite the right way to think of it. And this happens to be a graph of the performance graph uh, from a few years ago of a sieve of Eratosthenes exam, a simple sieve of Eratosthenes parallel program that illustrates an effect which I think is fairly typical actually. Uh, so the blue line here is uh, the sieve run, uh, example running with mutexes protecting concurrent accesses. Uh, the green line is essentially using sequentially consistent atomics and the red line underneath you can think of uh, using, relaxed, uh, using relaxed atomics that we'll talk about which just avoid the fences which happens to be safe in this case. Um, what you see here is that in fact there's a significant difference in performance at low process accounts this particular machine is very hardware, very memory bandwidth limited at high processor accounts. Basically, you still have all those over, all that overhead for the fences, uh, but in fact, the overhead is being overlapped between different uh, threads. So it's not actually adding to the total runtime because the bottleneck is still the memory. So in fact, in, at least on this particular machine at high processor accounts, it actually doesn't make all that much difference. Um, the cost is there, but it's uh, sort of, at, uh, it, in fact, it, may, it makes your scalability really look better because it slows down. Uh, the mutex version in some, some ways scales best because it has the highest single processor account cost and at 32 processors, it doesn't really make much difference anymore. Oops. Uh, so in order to address this cost, nonetheless, because many people still want to reduce this, the cost, and in fact, there are many cases where it actually is beneficial to reduce the, the cost. Uh, C++ 11 uh, and later also provide weekly ordered atomics that relax the ordering guarantees that are normally associated with these sequentially consistent, uh, sequentially consistent atomics. Um, so it's no longer, uh, these no longer preserve the illusion that threads execute by interleaving steps of individual threads, that we just always execute the next step of one, one thread or another. Uh, things can appear to be very visibly to be reordered and to, uh, to execute out of order. We no longer hide that, and we no longer hide that in order to improve performance and to eliminate the uh, these memory fences that are needed to enforce the stronger ordering primarily. It all, they also end up giving the compiler some more degrees of freedom, which may or may not help. Um, so we basically give you the option for atomic accesses to explicitly specify memory ordering. Uh, and I'll talk about 
basically two kinds of relaxations of memory ordering here in this talk. Uh, so we have memory order acquire, memory order release, and for read modify operations, read, read modify write operations, the combination acquire release. Uh, these basically preserve the ordering that you need most of the time, or many times. Uh, on the other hand, they, they do away with what I term the SL ordering. They no longer guarantee that a store followed by a load can't be reordered. Um, uh, that reordering is allowed. The other reorderings are still prohibited. Uh, the other one we'll talk about is memory order relaxed, uh, which sacrifices basically all the ordering guarantees, leaving only the indivisibility that's associated with atomics. Uh, it still gives you one very weak reordering guarantee, which is that accesses to the same memory location can't be reordered. That would be somewhat confusing, and uh, we decided not to export an atomic type that doesn't at least give you that guarantee. Um, so memory order relax is much cheaper when you can use it on something like, especially something like ARM v7, because it basically avoids all the fences that are normally associated with atomics. Um, Okay, and I'm going to insert lots of warnings here because I don't really want to encourage people to use, the, to use these. Uh, but uh, there are cases when they're appropriate, and I'm trying to sort of get the balance across here. So the ugly side of these weekly ordered atomics is that they're extremely complex and difficult to understand. So use them with, uh, with extreme caution. Uh, as I'll try to convince you in a minute here, the rules are not at all obvious. Um, and in fact, the rules are so bad that even the committee doesn't really understand it. So if you look at, if you look at the definition of memory order relaxed, uh, there's in a lot of hand waving in the standard actually, in the, in the C++14 standard. The C++11 standard was more precise. We decided it was wrong. Uh, so we threw that out and we decided we didn't really know how to define it precisely. So we replaced the, the offense, offending wording with hand waving in C++14. Um, this is not well liked by the people trying to do formal program verification who don't, can't make heads or tails out of it. Uh, so you should be aware of that issue. Uh, if you're going to formally verify a program, don't use memory order relaxed. Uh, I'm not talking about memory order consume here, which was, I think, is in its current form, I can safely describe as a failed experiment. Uh, it's in, the, in C++ 11 and 14, and in 17, we'll basically have a disclaimer, don't use it yet until we get it right. Uh, so, so follow that advice. Um, the other point that I'm only going to mention in passing here, but that's actually important, is that if you're using these things, if you think that you can use weekly ordered atomics inside a clever implementation inside a library, and that your client will, not, will never be able to notice, you're probably wrong. Uh, for for non-trivial uses of these, the general experience is that it, it's very difficult to completely hide these things inside a library. The semantics tend to show through to the client. Uh, so you should keep that in mind, though I won't go into the details there. Uh, so my advice here to reiterating is, first of all, uh, if they work, or use mutexes or transactional memory. Um, if you have a simple case where you're uh, basically all accesses that are protected by a given mutex only access a single variable and they only access it once, then it's easy and straightforward to replace that by a sequentially consistent atomic. You'll get the same semantics. It's no harder to reason about. Uh, and you'll get a little bit of speed out of that. Um, if you need to access variables from signal handlers, uh, your first line of, you generally don't care that much about performance. You, you should generally use sequentially consistent atomics uh, and use them very carefully because very often you will end up having to use more complicated lock-free algorithms, which are very difficult to get right. Just it's difficult because it's difficult to get the right level of atomicity. Um, if you measure and the, your program really runs too slowly, you really want to use, uh, use atomics for performance, you should, you should think twice, uh, but you can consider more using more complicated lock-free algorithms with atomics. Um, and you should, at that point, you may also want to consider uh, 
using weekly audit atomics, but remembering to be really careful and that these things really are bug, bug magnet and many of them end up getting used incorrectly. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk here is basically go through some of some pitfalls to illustrate some of these issues and then give you sort of with give you a collection of recipes that I've encountered for which weekly audit atomics actually do seem to make sense and be relatively safe. Uh, there may be some at the end that are complicated. Most of the ones, that, if I have enough time, the ones at the beginning are, fa are fairly simple and understandable. The ones at the end are more sort of illustrations of how these things can get really complicated and recipes that uh, might be useful to follow even without f sort of fully understanding why they work. Um, so the, the initial pitfall I want to start here is start with here is the obvious one that applies to all atomics, not just weekly ordered atomics which is that you have to be careful about the, uh, the, uh, the granularity of atomicity here. So in particular, if you have an atomic variable, this is well illustrated by the fact that x equals x plus one is not the same as x plus uh, x plus. plus. Um, x equals x plus one consists of two axes to x. It consists of an atomic load, an increment, and an atomic store. If two threads do this concurrently, they may both end up reading the value and writing back the same value rather than actually incrementing it twice. X plus plus on an atomic, on an atomic int uh, is really an atomic increment because that's the way it's defined. So it really happens atomically as one indivisible operation and you're guaranteed that if two threads do this concurrently, X will get incremented twice. Uh, only the, the actual functions on atomic of T only a single function call is, is indivisible, not combinations of them. Uh, you can hide that with really clever algorithms sometimes, but that's way beyond this talk. Uh, so now getting sp more into weakly ordered atomics, um, the ordering constraints here are really quite subtle. This is sort of a meta comment. If we get around to the examples at the end, then you can see exactly how, uh, how subtle the ordering constraints can be. And this is, as I said earlier, this is really a very common source of errors. So that's sort of the, the meta one. Um, now I'll get into some more concrete pitfalls here, uh, some of which have actually turned into more of a problem recently as, uh, as hardware and compilers have gotten more sophisticated. Uh, so this particular example is an attempt to take the uh, example I had before, which required the store to load ordering and to relax the memory ordering on that in ways that are, that are not correct. So this example is not correct. Um, in this particular case, I've really only relaxed the ordering on the stores, uh, store operations. The, the load operations are still sequentially consistent. Uh, many people seem to have this idea, which happens to hold on some architectures and not others, that because I use a sequentially consistent operation in here, that somehow orders the other, the other weekly ordered operations. That's not in general true. That's not the way these things are actually defined. Uh, so if I relax the store operation to a memory order release, that gives away my SL guarantee, my store to load ordering guarantee. So what happens in that case is the compiler now is no longer required to actually preserve the order. The co compiler and the hardware are no longer required to preserve the order of the store and the load. So in fact, the compiler may choose to do the load first in both, uh, both threads, uh, see that both of them in fact are still false, go ahead and then execute the store in both threads. And at that point, uh, both threads will go ahead and turn the light to green, and I'll get the result shown on the slide here. Uh, interactions with other synchronization mechanisms like locks are also not really what, uh, what people expect. I've seen some sort of, some fairly widely distributed code that basically uh, falls back, that basically checks, am I compiling with C++11? Do I have the appropriate atomic uh, fence operations, which I haven't really talked about here yet? Uh, if so, use those to enforce ordering. Otherwise, I'll just use some critical section. I'll use a mutex to enforce ordering 
between these different operations because after all, a critical section is going to ensure that uh, things don't get reordered uh, around the critical section. That's really wrong. So here's sort of the canonical example here. Again, now I've uh, changed both of the, the store and load operations to be relaxed. Uh, and I've tried to enforce ordering by putting a critical section in the middle there. Um, it turns out that's not sufficient. The easiest way to think of that not being sufficient is a critical section normally has, in the, if you look at the details of the memory model, a critical section ensures that operations inside the critical section don't move outside. The compiler can't move operations outside the critical section since that would unprotect them and clearly break the code but it can move things into critical sections. So in particular, the memory model rules are written in such a way that both the store and the load here can move into the intervening critical section and pass each other. So that this in fact does not enforce ordering between the store and the load. Uh, this one is particularly nasty because it so happened that most critical section implementations in the past have in fact enforced this sort of ordering. We're starting to see some now that don't. Uh, so I expect some code to break as we work this out. And that's precisely the, the point here. Uh, traditionally, compilers didn't reorder cost synchronization. They still don't really. And the synchronization operations were implemented as hardware fences. Uh, increasingly, they're not implemented as hardware fences. Again, if you look at something like ARM v8, in fact, the synchronization operations have a, are only one-way reordering barriers. You can move things into the critical section, just not out of them. There were some older architectures like Itanium that also did that. Um, another pitfall here. Uh, many people think of one way to enforce, order, to enforce ordering between atomics is sort of uh, data dependencies or control dependencies in some way. Certainly if one load is dependent on another, they have to be executed in order. Uh, that unfortunately, that notion of dependency turns out to be very hard to define precisely. And here's sort of an illustration. I've attempted to illustrate why it's so difficult to define and why in fact it doesn't hold for any reasonable definition. So what I'm doing here is I'm first loading X and then I'm using the result of that load of X uh, to load a field uh, of the structure that X pointed to. And you might think that those, in fact, are, are guaranteed to be executed in order. And in fact, at some very low hardware level, if you translated this naively to assembly language, actually, amusingly enough, they would be executed in order on modern hardware uh, for reasons that have to do with Java rather than C++. Um, but in fact, if you compile this code with a C++ compiler uh, and look at the result, there are perfectly reasonable and acceptable transformations that violate that. Uh, so what can happen here is in this particular case, I actually have this other comparison of the result of the load of X to pointer. And um, only if that comparison is true, then I actually dereference it. The problem is that my compiler might actually notice at that point uh, that, well, pointer and y have to be the same in that context. So why don't I just go ahead and dereference y instead of, uh, instead of pointer because I know they're the same. So I'll go ahead and do that. Okay, that's part of the problem. The other part of the conspiracy here is that the hardware decides that, well, I want to execute your code quickly I don't want to really check to wait if that condition is true or not. I, I'll just guess it's true and go ahead. And then I'll verify afterwards that it's correct. And if it wasn't, I'll back up. And, uh, routine, and uh, modern processes do that routinely. So what happens in this case, I can in fact execute the second load off of Y uh, early on before knowing the truth of that, uh, that condition and then go ahead and execute the load of X in reverse order and afterwards, I may verify, yeah, my guess was correct. The condition was satisfied. So therefore, in fact, it's fine. I did the right thing. But now the, the second load actually appeared to execute before the first load. OK, so I'm now going to switch gears from, from pitfalls uh, 
to how to actually do this. Uh, so the, the general rule here is for actually using these relax operations is if I'm going to use re acquire release operations, the only guarantee I really get is that memory operations preceding the release operation, preceding the release store, are visible after I do a load that sees the result of that store. Um, other kinds of operations, other kinds of reasoning about ordering are still invalid here. So this is tricky. We'll look at some, uh, some examples here where this actually works. Uh, relaxed really only ensures ordering for that operation, uh, for operations on that particular memory location. And if I look at one of these operations, if I look at the result of a relaxed operation, I really can't conclude anything from that about where the rest of the program is or what the rest of the program state looks like. And as I said, consume, we're going to avoid. Um, yeah, and again, the disclaimer here that if for general use of these, you really need to understand the memory model in more detail than I'm presenting here. So these are the common cases. So a common case where I've seen relaxed used uh, successfully, in, at least in ways that are not obviously broken, is uh, to update uh, single, basically single location data structures, which uh, are actually, su actually surprisingly common in real code bases as far as I can tell. So these are basically single word data structures that don't interact with other, with other data. So I'm just accumulating information in the parallel parts of the program and then only looking at the data structure after all the information has been properly joined, after I've properly synchronized with the other threads so that I know where they are. So the most common example of that is clearly, uh, is clearly an atomic counter. Uh, there are better ways to, there's ways to implement more scalable counters, but a really simple way to, to correctly implement a counter that's only read at the end of the program is to use one of these atomic update operations like fetch add to, to increment the counter, and uh, that operation can use memory order relaxed because I don't really care about the result of that value, so I'm not going to... Typically, I'm going to just going to throw away the result that I get from the, the fetch add. Uh, so I'm definitely not going to make any decisions based on the value I got back. I just want the correct value at the end. I might also accumulate something in a bit set, in a short bit set, by just oring into it as I'm running and only look at the final bit set at the end after I've properly synchronized with all the other threads and I know all the other threads are, are done with what they were doing. Um, and those work correctly. A warning sign, a place to be careful here if you're looking at a code base, the place that, something that looks very suspicious is actually looking at the result of these things. If you see a relaxed operation that looks at the result, then you really need to look closely. Um, another common use case for memory order relaxed where it's entirely safe is if you're performing an operation that just doesn't affect program correctness that's sort of important to making the program run well, efficiently, but your program is not going to break basically no matter what you get. So a common example of that is a compare exchange loop. Um, what you're doing there initially, typically you load a value, uh, then you compute a function here foo on the old value, and you try to, you replace the old value with foo of old if it hasn't changed in the meantime. Now, it so happens that uh, it doesn't really matter if the value you loaded at the beginning was wrong. All that's going to do is make the while loop go for one more iteration. Uh, so that's entirely fine. We're not, relying on the, uh, we're not relying on the result in any way. Another common place to use relaxed access is actually is if you're uh, accessing an atomic variable in a context in which the, you know that there's no racing access. So you actually didn't, don't need the, uh, the access to be atomic because you know nobody else can be modifying it. So a very common example of this is, uh, is what's called double check locking. Um, in this case, what I'm doing is I want to initialize some variable x on demand only when I need it to be, only when I need to use it. So I'm going to do it lazily, uh, but I'm going to do it in a way that avoids locking on the fast path. So that avoids any lock acquisition unless I'm actually going to initialize the variable. And we'll, if we have time, we'll see this in the, 
uh, slightly refine this uh, version of this in a few slides again. Um, so what I do is I first check, has X been initialized? And uh, that's a, a, in this slide, that's a regular atomic access with the normal sequentially consistent guarantees. So I know that if X has been initial, if I see X init equal to true, then I can see all the initialization work that's previously been done by these SNL guarantees because the previous initializing thread actually did an atomic store at the end and I now see the result of that load. So therefore I'm, I'm guaranteed to also see X initialized. Um, so if, but if X was not, if X init is true, then I'm fine. If X was not initialized, then I go ahead and acquire a lock protecting the initialization. Uh, I, at that point, load it again to make sure it hasn't changed in the meantime. Nobody came in and initialized it in the interim. But now I'm holding a lock that protects the initialization. So at that point, I actually know that nobody else is going to be changing X init. Um, because the only change to X init is in this critical section further down, which might be executed by another thread, but that other thread would have to hold the lock. So using a memory order relax there is entirely fine. If I still see it's not, it's not been initialized, then I go ahead and initialize X and set X init to true. Uh, again, X init is an atomic, so at that point, X has been initialized, and I do an atomic store, which makes sure that everybody who sees the load result uh, will see the initialization correctly. So, um, okay, so that, that was the, the last example for memory order relaxed. Let me switch gears to acquire release here briefly. So the canonical use case for acquire release is this simple communication idea that we saw earlier on a slide already. So this is the MP example from at the beginning. Uh, but I noticed already at that point that I don't need the SL guarantee. I only need to make sure really that if, um, in this case, again, we're initializing something, this is the simplest scenario, that if I set, if I see X init having been set to true by another thread, then I'm also guaranteed that X is, is initialized. This is precisely the kind of guarantee that I get out of acquire release. So in this particular case, I can relax that example from the beginning and use acquire release ordering, specifying release on the store and acquire on the load, and I still preserve the semantics correctly. So that still works, and this is actually quite a quite common case. Um, if, uh, if you heard people talk about RCU or something, that's a more complicated case that's basically based on a similar kind of, uh, of setup. Uh, we can also use basically the same case, again, already occurred in the double-check locking. I warned you that you'd see, the, see it again. Uh, so this is double-check locking refined further. Uh, so again, when I check X init here, this is basically the same thing as on the last slide. Uh, I really only need acquire semantics at the beginning. When I do the initial check, uh, has it already been initialized? I need to make sure that I can actually see the initialization if it's happened. So I need acquire semantics there, but that's all I need. I don't need the default sequentially consistent semantics. Um, and similarly, when I do the initialization, I need to store with release semantics to make sure that the initialization actually is visible to somebody seeing the uh, seeing X in it true with the uh, with the acquire load. Um, another fairly common use case for acquire release, and you can think of this as really the the place they got the name in a sense is uh, if I want to implement simple locks, and this is one of several examples where really sort of 99.9% 90, .9 of the time you should use standard library facilities rather than implementing your own. But if you were going to implement your own lock, um, you would do something like what I have on the slide here. In general, for lock acquisition, I need to make sure that operations don't move out of the critical section. Um, so I need to make sure uh, I need to make sure that the load is not, the load part of the, uh, the exchange there is not reordered with subsequent memory operations. That's what acquire does. And similarly for the store, I need to make, need to, the converse guarantee, I need to make sure that earlier operations become visible before I actually complete the store so that those are not reordered. Uh, so for, 
uh, for lock entry, I need acquire semantics. For lock exit, I need release semantics. Now, your actual locking protocol might be more complicated and involve multiple atomics, in which case this becomes more complicated. But if a really simple dumb spin lock or something like that, uh, it basically acquire on entry and release on exit is sufficient. Um, okay, we still have a little bit of time, so let me quickly go through some uh, some complex examples, which I suspect I won't be able to explain in the time I have here, but sort of uh, hopefully give you some uh, some insight into the the kinds of complexities that you run into. Okay, so the first one, which is sort of an ongoing saga, this is actually what I've been spending a lot of my day job on recently, um, is reference counting, memory ordering for reference counting. Uh, so the first observation, again, is please use shared putter because then we have to fix the bugs in only one place. Um, but having said that, uh, the, basically these reference counting, normally if you implement reference counting, it will be implemented, most likely be implemented in a, with thread safety guarantees similar to standard shared putter which basically, which do not provide thread safety for pointer assignment, for shared pointer assignments themselves. If you concurrently access, if you concurrently assign to the same shared pointer in two threads, very, very bad things will happen. Never do that. Um, on the other hand, the shared pointer implementation is thread safe in the sense that if you concurrently access different shared pointers, bec just because they happen to refer to the same underlying object, uh, you will not get a data race. So there are no data races invented as a result of the reference counting, which it turns out means that the reference counting operations underneath, the actually incrementing the reference counting and decrementing the reference counting have to be atomic operations, or they have to be protected by a lock. Most implementations use atomic operations. Um, so the question is, what memory ordering do you need to guarantee there? And people usually care because this uh, reference count operations tend to be very performance critical. It turns out, um, if you think about this long and hard, what you actually need uh, is for the reference count increment, it turns out actually a relaxed operation is sufficient. Uh, because the client actually makes, has to make sure that all of those operations, all the reference count increments have to happen before the final re compensating reference count decrement. So those are already ordered with respect to the reference count decrement. The tricky ordering guarantee here is you need to make sure that by the time the reference count gets decremented the last time, you're actually going to deallocate the object. At that point, you can see all prior, operate, all prior operations on the object have been visible to you so that no operations on this object become visible after, after you deallocate it. Um, so the, the general way, the simple way of doing this is when you do the, uh, the reference count subtraction to do an acquire release, op perform an acquire release operation so that in fact there's a well-defined ordering among all the reference count decrements. And by the time, it turns out the visibility rules are such, are such that by the time you do the last decrement, in fact, everything that happened to the object is visible to you at that point. Um, so this is sort of the part we agree on. It actually turned out it came up in earlier discussions today. We don't actually quite agree on what unique should do. And my theory is that it should actually be, a, a, it, need, it needs an acquire operation. But if you look at some of the implementations, that's actually not what it does. So something, um, at least uh, libc++ currently doesn't do that. I haven't looked at the others. Um, uh, so there are some issues. So actually getting the, the point here is that getting this right is really quite tricky. Um, and you should first of all use somebody else's implementation so you can blame them for any bugs. Uh, um, if that fails, please look at what else, the advice that you find on, on the web from the best implementations and uh, copy those rather than trying to invent your own because this stuff is really quite tricky. Actually, a note on reference counting, if you actually follow that advice and look on the web, web what people recommend, they actually recommend something else for reference count decrement, so I simplified somewhat. In fact, you can get away, get away with using, a, using an explicit fence, which potentially uh, enforces the acquire ordering only on the last one. Um, this 
this is rather tricky. Its performance benefit, I think, is increasingly dubious on x86 and ARM v8. I don't think it makes a difference. On some of the other architectures, this is probably still a slight win. Um, so here's an, another sort of really complicated example. I actually published a paper in a research conference about this, so it gives you some idea. Uh, so the, the issue here is that uh, we have data, and this, this occurs fairly commonly. Uh, it's used fairly commonly or semi-commonly in the Linux kernel, for example. Uh, that we have data that's uh, very rarely updated but very frequently read. If we actually protect it by a mutex, the problem with that is, or even if we uh, uh, protect it by some sort of uh, reader-writer lock, uh, shared mutex or the like, uh, the problem is that uh, just updating the mutex either introduces contention so every time you read, you're actually writing to the mutex or the shared mutex, which means that you will go much more slowly because you're fighting over the cache line that's holding the shared mutex. So people have figured out very clever techniques to avoid actually modifying memory and readers. And this is sort of one of the earlier schemes. Uh, I'll see you, I think it's a somewhat later scheme for doing this. So the basic model here is in the writer uh, for we, for the purposes of these slides, I'll assume that right, I, we, I don't care about the performance of right, so I'll be sloppy. Uh, so I will have a, an atomic version counter. Uh, the writer just acquires a lock to make sure that there's only one writer. Uh, before performing any operations, uh, any modifications to the data, it increments a version counter, and at the end it increments the version counter again. Uh, so I know that when the version counter is odd, something fishy is going on. So if a reader ever sees an odd version counter, it knows that there's a writer working on this and it should leave it, it should ignore it. Uh, if the version counter is even, um, then I know that things are, uh, things are okay. If I read the version counter at the beginning, then read the data and read the version counter again, and it's unchanged and, and even both times, then I know that I got a consistent snapshot. So that's the basic idea here. Uh, what the reader does is it reads the version number, reads the data, reads the version number, does no writes, and then checks that the version numbers were the same. If they weren't, it tries it again because the writer got into the middle. So that's, that's the basic algorithm. So the question is now, how do we optimize this with respect to memory ordering? Um, and again, I'm looking at only the reader here. Um, so this is actually tricky in many ways, but um, the first observation is that technically by C++ rules, the way you would like to write this actually doesn't work. Uh, because when I'm reading the data, it may be written by the writer at the same time. Uh, so therefore the read, even though it's protected by these version tests, in fact may race. So that invokes undefined behavior. So the consequence of that is that I, in fact, can't do ordinary reads on the data. The data itself also has to, has to consist of some number of atomic, uh, mem atomic objects. Uh, so what my code is really going to look like is the, co um, the data reads in the middle uh, will all be relaxed reads of atomics. And I need to make sure that the version reads are not reordered with respect to those. It turns out I can easily ensure the reorder, absence of reordering at the beginning uh, by doing an acquire load. Um, re ensuring the absence of reordering at the begin at the end is actually quite tricky, and this is sort of the most convincing use case, maybe the only use case I found really convincing for actually using the C++11 memory fences. So what I do there is I actually introduce an atomic thread fence of memory order require, which it turns out has roughly the effect of turning the, the earlier relaxed loads into acquire loads, but not preventing ordering among, reordering among them. So the data loads can still be reordered among themselves, but they must happen before, they must uh, not be reordered with the later version uh, load. Uh, and I actually made one mistake here on the slide here. The second version load should also be memory order relaxed. 
because I'm enforcing its ordering. Uh, making it sequentially consistent actually doesn't help. So conclusions. Well, weekly audit atomics are hard. Hopefully the last few slides convinced you, if not before. Uh, uh, the good news is that there actually seem to be a relatively, at least based on my recent experience, a relatively small number of, use, uh, of uh, recipes that cover a reasonable fraction of, of the, uh, the use cases. Uh, for anything else more complicated, you really do need to understand the memory model. Um, there are various explanations out there. There's probably room for more careful, more careful ones. I think this is also an incomplete list. I think there are also some there are probably some other important ones that I've missed here. Uh, so there's an old WG14 paper that sort of gives a sort of fairly high level overview. Uh, for those of you who really want to understand the C++ memory model and have the patience to do so in the mathematical background, I actually uh, recommend Mark Batty's thesis, so chapter three in Mark Batty's thesis, which is a, a very precise mathematical uh, description. Uh, you can also try to read the standard itself. On the other hand, um, I think the memory model, I personally think the memory model is actually sort of an illustration of the abuse of standard Ds. This is not something that, uh, um, this is something really that's much better expressed in mathematics than it is in, under the constraints of, the, uh, of an ISO standard. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Hi. Um, could you explain a little more the um, need for the ordering requirements when you were doing a reference counter? Uh, it, it seems to me naively that if I'm using a reference counter for a shared object, I should not have any modifications to that shared object that need to become visible when I release the shared pointer or the shared um, reference count. Uh, the problem is if I have some... Uh, if I had some independent uses of an object in, in two different threads, and then at the end, it actually goes both ways. The easiest way to think of it probably is in terms of a modification. But say thread one still modifies the object, and then if it just did a relaxed decrement of the reference count. Uh, and then thread two uh, now decides it's done with the object, uh, does another decrement of the reference count and then deallocates it. The problem is at that point, threads, thread one's modification may not be visible yet and may still, may still appear to occur to thread, on thread two after thread two has deallocated the object. So thread two may put it back on the free list and then at that point and reuse it and at that point the modification from thread one can become visible. There's also, I mean, the, the, probably the others, the converse scenario is actually more likely where thread one is, has read the object and the load actually doesn't, uh, doesn't become, in some sense, doesn't occur until after thread two has deallocated it. Yes, I have a question about slide number six. If you could just. Uh, um, let's see, number six. says that it's basically, uh, as stores become visible to other threads after prime memory operations, this is uh, memory order sequential, basically free on x86. I was always in the impression that it's a full fence, it's exchange operations, so can uh, elaborate on that. Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, x86 is a little tricky. If you look at the assembly code that's generated for sequentially consistent atomics on x86, you will invariably get confused. Uh, the problem is the, the store actually implicitly guarantees the S property, which is sort of the most important one. So you don't actually need a fence for that um, because x86 naturally is, is fairly strongly ordered. Uh, it does not guarantee SL. Uh, the hardware by itself does not guarantee SL, so you actually need to use a fence just to just in case there's an atomic load following the atomic store. Uh, so the expensive fence is actually issued for a very unlikely case. The common case is free. Thank you. Uh would you say that uh, using an atomic instead of mutex when you need, say, a million of mutexes is a reasonable thing to do? Uh, 
uh, an atomic instead of a... A mutex. Say you have a, you need a million of mutexes. Would, that, um, would using an atomic be a, a reasonable thing? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the case. If it's a really, again, if it's a really simple case and you're okay with sequentially consistent atomics or something, they're just an optimization of sort of the single operation critical section. That's an easy case. Uh, very often in other cases where you want lots of mutexes, it's also reasonable to shout the, the mutexes so that you map a whole bunch of objects to the same mutex, uh, which is in fact what uh, Atomic usually does underneath in the implementation in the case where the hardware doesn't support the object size. Basically, object addresses will get mapped to a, a reasonable sized collection of, of mutexes, and those will be used to protect those objects. Thanks. Thanks. I have a question for uh, slide number 33. Oh, okay. Right, so you said it should be uh, acquire fence and then relaxed load. Why not just uh, acquire load for the V2? Uh, good question. The problem is that actually enforces exactly the wrong ordering. You can think of an acquire load as ordering with respect to subsequent memory operations. Whereas here, this is one of the few oddball cases where you really want a load ordered with respect to prior operations. And that's something that we don't actually, the atomics themselves don't really have good support for. I've seen in some source code bases where there's some notion of a release load, which actually, if you look at the memory model, doesn't make much sense. But that's sort of used in precisely these cases, these oddball cases, where you want an ordering of a load with respect to, to prior operation, in this, in this case, really prior loads. All right, thank you. Uh, I have a question about the slide about dependencies uh, not enforcing uh, the order in between, uh, with respect to threads. I don't remember the number, sorry. Uh, let me see. Yeah, this one. Uh, is it really possible to see uh, reordering in hardware on modern architectures as opposed to uh, the loads being reordered by the compiler, except for alpha, maybe? Um, Actually, oh, you mean this sort of uh, reordering? It's not the the hardware by itself will not break things in this case. Again, the the reasoning for that is that all modern architectures, in fact, at the assembly level, have some notion of dependency that they enforce. The problem is this notion uh, is doesn't really make sense at the source level. This is sort of one of the obstacles we've been running into with memory order consume, as you can see in this example. So here it, it looks like at the source level there's a dependence, but the compiler can compile it to something that gets rid of the dependence, thereby speeding up the code, but getting rid of the, uh, the ordering guarantee, dependency-based ordering guarantees in the assembly code. So th this really requires uh, a conspiracy between the, the hardware and the compiler. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thanks for coming.